day two of Automotive Logistics Russia. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the, the gala dinner uh, last night. Those of you who were patient enough to wait through the, the ride there or hung around between the first and second course, um, I think you find that it, it was indeed worth it. Uh, some things are worth the wait after all. Um, and um, yeah, I think it, it was, a lot, yesterday was a very interesting day. Heard a lot of uh, interesting topics. We know the market is, is difficult right now, but, um, but there's also a, a lot that, that can be rewarding about Russia. Um, in the last session yesterday, we heard a lot about uh, the challenges that, let's say, logistics providers might face in having to uh, reduce their costs at the same time as increase quality and invest in fleets. Um, so, you know, that kind of segues a little bit into this morning session if we talk about serving the customer, uh, or let's, yeah, delighting your customer, keeping your customer, whether we're talking about the, the end customer uh, buying the car or, in fact, the OEM, um, uh, logistics providers need, need to show a lot of flexibility and uh, a lot of efficiency. Um, unfortunately, we, we were, uh, Eugenie uh, Sukhoi from General Motors wasn't able to join us this morning, but um, actually he, he posted something a couple of minutes ago on uh, the live stream. Uh, those of you who weren't here yesterday, um, if you don't recall, we are streaming this session uh, live uh, to, to a global audience. And you can log on and comment uh, and make, make comments or, or follow us there. And Eugenie wrote, uh, after sales and spare parts in the current economic situation, uh, we need to focus on the two or three year strategy and minimize our structural cost, keeping high service levels um, for dealers and customers, including parts availability, order processing, and delivery time. At the same time, Russia can recover very fast if we recall the 2010-2011 experience, and operational flexibility will come uh, on the first place as well as, ability, as well as the ability to modernize. So just a few thoughts there from, from you, Jenny, that I think are, are worthwhile keeping in mind. Again, looking at the situation today in Russia, we know the market is, is, is struggling, but uh, this is a market that has a, a tendency to to, to go in very, very extreme cycles. So we need to be prepared uh, for the recovery as well as uh, dealing with uh, the, current, the current economic situation. Um, okay, well, and, and obviously we have, still have uh, some great panelists this morning who are gonna talk about serving customers uh, in Russia and the, the challenges and, and, and upsides of that. Uh, first, we'll be hearing from Mikhail Epp, the Global Accounts Director for Major Cargo Service. Um, I think the second order, where we'll hear from Mark Morgan, Director of Business Development at Unicar Group, and we're also joined by Bill Pollock, the CEO of CTM. Uh, so, as usual, we'll, we'll have presentations, and then we'll move to a Q&A. So, uh, I'd like to invite Mikhail to uh, make his presentation. Dear colleagues, judging by a decreased number of the delegates, the second day, uh, on the second day, the gala dinner of yesterday had some consequences, but back to work. My name is uh, Michael Epp. I represent the uh, major group of companies, and in the course of today's presentation, I want to speak about such an important part as delivery of spare parts from the central warehouse of the manufacturer up to the end user, the dealership, because many of you know that uh, it's one thing to sell a vehicle. As of today, you will have to uh, provide after-sales services afterwards, unfortunately, sometimes even repair services, so depending on how uh, well, uh, with good quality, and uh, how on time any spare part would be delivered to the end customer. Uh, the fact of uh, the overall satisfaction with the level of service uh, depends to a great extent. And I think that Meiji is quite a unique company in this light, uh, the Russian market. On the one hand, we are certainly selling vehicles. We are one of the biggest uh, automotive dealers. So we know well what usually the buyers of the vehicles know, what kind of service and what is of interest to the customer. On the other hand, the group of companies, our group of companies, has a logistic component, quite a big one. The transport and logistic group of major 
interacts very actively with the dealers in Russia in the automotive sector, but also with the uh, car manufacturers. So we understand what their car manufacturers want from us as a logistic provider as well as the dealers uh, want from us. What kind of uh, time uh, terms or what costs? In connection with this, the requirements, the requirements to the level of service, which we've heard a lot about from yesterday, uh, the service of the logistic provider. Several years ago, it was just a delivery from point A to point B, and now this is a kind of a, com a set of services, and this is a kind of a challenge which we very proactively accept. And I would like to show you today what we provide to some of our customers, a very interesting solution that probably will allow to some of you to find something new and valuable uh, and maybe at the end of the day optimize your logistics flow and logistics costs. So my favorite slide, the map of the Russian Federation, and actually one can speak about it for quite a long time, but as of now, how the distribution of spare parts uh, uh, pattern looks in the Russian Federation. The central warehouse, it belongs to the manufacturer. It may be based in the central region of the Russian Federation. In 80 percent, it's Moscow region. And a very broad uh, network of uh, dealerships located all over Russia. With such a pattern, the expectations the car manufacturer has in terms of uh, service and spare parts distribution. First and foremost, you would like to see U.S. car manufacturers. You want to see fixed uh, delivery uh, time because you have to understand when things will be delivered. You want to see the logistic services transparent. You want to know where uh, and when each uh, a batch of cargo is located, uh, if it is delayed, why so? and all the rest. You want also to see uh, and you expect a high level of security. Everything connected with a spare parts delivery, this uh, expensive cargo, and so we pay special attention to the security issues. You want to see op optimization of routes from the point of view of uh, lead times and minimizing the costs of this. Also, you as car manufacturers, uh, your end customer is automotive dealer, so the level of dealer satisfaction is also of great importance to you. Also, looking at the map of our country, it is very easy to understand the challenges and the difficulties with which we come across uh, as um, the logistic provider. The country is really huge. 10,000 kilometers from west to east is really a lot. Hence some problems in connection with this or some challenges. For example, no roads or very poor roads, especially critical for the east of the country. For example, to deliver a cargo to Magadan or Petropavlovsk Kamchatsky, you can use only a railroad or air. No other possibilities exist. Theoretically, you can go by car, but it will take about a month and it will be a one-way uh, route both for the car and for the driver. Second, uh, time difference. When we in the central region come to work, you, people uh, in Vladivostok usually, uh, for them, it's the end of the working day, hence certain difficulties in communication. Next, different requirements in terms of uh, express deliveries requirements. If um, a car is broken and you need certain parts uh, urgently, you expect that the logistic provider will uh, uh, offer you a special solution in terms of express delivery. Different and quite a lot of uh, destinations, delivery destinations. So sometimes our customers may have more than 100 dealerships, and this is uh, also a kind of a challenge. And another important issue, which we have come across quite recently, many car manufacturers come to the fact that all the solutions in terms of warehouse processing of the cargo are sent to their dealers. Uh, is outsourced to the logistic provider. The manufacturer doesn't want to have anything to do with it. So that it's uh, the overall headache of the logistics provider. 
based on all these expectations of the car manufacturer, as well as uh, all the challenges and difficulties we come across uh, with as a logistics company, what kind of a solution can we offer? This is one of the solutions that is used in practice. It has proven to be very effective and did uh, looks as follows. Nothing unique here, a standard set of operations, but there are some unique solutions, some unique know-how that have been introduced. The central warehouse that belongs to the car manufacturer and from which the cargo is uh, collected. Most of the car manufacturers don't, uh, cannot forecast the volume of the cargo that will be shipped from it. <clears throat> it's very difficult to forecast it for tomorrow, for the day after tomorrow, but you as a car manufacturer are interested that everything that is prepared for shipment would be collected from your warehouse. That's why we use the solution that is as follows. We have some additional costs, but we uh, provide uh, the trucks with a certain reserve, uh, uh, reserve space that can be used for the additional cargo the warehouse or the car manufacturer may have. We are ready to bear this additional cost, uh, thus providing you this special service. Then we also include the, our own warehouse into this chain at which the cross-docking of the cargo takes place, and we conduct the warehouse operations at our warehouse in which the car manufacturer is not interested. We accept the cargo. We weigh it, uh, we measure it, we may um, form the batches uh, out of this uh, or meter it in batches. Uh, we assign a certain urgency grade to the cargo and uh, we label and package uh, the cargo if needed because we have to trace and track the cargo and uh, on the basis uh, of uh, all the limitations on one transportation means or other on the basis of uh, the delivery dates, we decide where and when one cargo or other would go to which destination. Based on this information, we, as uh, said, we uh, may decide to send the cargo by air, by rail, or by road. And the final part of this chain that certainly impacts the quality of the service for the final, for the end customer is uh, the door, delivery to the door, not just to the uh, station of destination. There are many companies that would say that uh, we may deliver to the station and you will have to collect your cargo from there, but we deliver to the door. And with this pattern, uh, that's the transit uh, time terms. They may be different for, uh, for different uh, means of transport uh, and certainly depending on the final destination within the uh, Russian Federation. One, two days for the air. Two days uh, if you deliver to Vladivostok is very good. Four to 12 days for railroad. 12 days is a very good transit time if we deliver to the Far East. And one to seven days if we deliver by road. As uh, I've already said, the pattern looks very simple and very understandable on the first side, but there are some key issues that may influence the efficiency of the whole chain. First, the collection of uh, cargo. We collect the cargo at a certain point of time. We usually uh, approve uh, this with a car manufacturer, say, at noon. Certainly, we have to take into account the possibilities and opportunities of the car manufacturer's warehouse, but also the schedule of all kinds of uh, airlines uh, uh, and other modes of transportation. Thus, you can forecast the work of your warehouse. You know that at noon, a certain logistics provider will come to your warehouse who will collect the cargo for such and such dealers. It is easier for you to plan the work of your warehouse and your personnel. The logistics provider warehouse conducts a lot of operations in terms of preparing the cargo for transportation, weighing, uh, labeling, measuring, 
we have to know the uh, dimensions of the uh, cargo, especially if we send it by air, because not all airlines would take uh, uh, heavy cargo. Then we have to prepare the documents and make a decision uh, in terms of the mode of transport. It's uh, very critical to do this as quick as possible, so the organization of the uh, 3PL warehouse is really crucial. Two hours is the maximum that uh, uh, should be necessary to process the whole cargo. And the same day we deliver the cargo uh, for airlines and railroad deliveries. And you have to understand that the 3PL provider knows uh, the schedule of uh, the air flights and uh, railroad services because if he doesn't know this information, he probably wouldn't be able to submit your cargo the same day uh, to go to the airline to go to Vladivostok, which means that the next day your cargo won't arrive to Vladivostok. So when you are selecting the 3PL uh, partner, you have to understand and uh, you have to understand how well developed uh, the network, the transportation network this 3PL provider has. If we look at this scheme, we see that the 3PL provider is not connected with the dealers. He simply delivers the cargo, but I think this is not correct. I think that it is extremely necessary that your 3PL provider would have uh, uh, a very uh, close contact with your end uh, consumers or dealers. Why so? First, in order to notify, to inform, you can actually outsource this part of work to the 3PL provider, uh, visually inform the dealers about when the cargo would be delivered. This may be done automatically. Or, for example, sometimes approve some special uh, terms and conditions of delivery with the dealer. For example, we came across a situation when the dealers based in Vladivostok could not unload some high and heavier uh, cargo. And we actually approved uh, uh, provision of this additional service. It was the decision taken by the 3PL company, not the car manufacturer. And a very key issue is why the key moment in terms of why there should be a good uh, connection between the 3PL provider and the dealer uh, is uh, the collection and gathering of the feedback uh, about the quality of the services provided. A very good example from real life. We had such a situation. We conducted a regular questionnaire among dealers, and as a feedback, we received such information that they were not uh, fully satisfied with the packaging of the spare parts. So we discussed it all together with the car manufacturer and suggested, uh, proposed them some additional solutions because actually the packaging was provided by the car manufacturer. So we changed the packaging and thus increased the level of satisfaction of the dealers. So these interactions are really of great importance. A few words about uh, uh, document exchange and interactions. You all know that interactions between car manufacturer and uh, logistics services provider uh, go both ways. We provide all kinds of reports in terms of uh, deliveries, KPIs, and the level of satisfaction of the dealers. As for the dealers, we interact in terms of quality, and we also collect all the information that would confirm the delivery of the cargo. So from the point of view of the uh, documents exchange, nothing difficult. As one of uh, the additional benefits, for using a good professional logistics company is that a good logistics uh, provider ex can offer you not only a good logistics solution, but also IT solutions, which very often are customized. And this provides uh, a better predictability for your services. All kinds of uh, e uh, uh, documents uh, for your processes. Uh, you can also ask uh, for the track and trace service, and a good provider uh, can always secure this service in order for you to 
Track and Trace your cargo. Uh, confirmation uh, of delivery or PODs, which is very important for the car manufacturers. And sometimes it may be very difficult for us as a logistics provider to collect the way bills from the dealers in Vladivostok, for example. Now, a few words about KPI. We are also, as well as the car manufacturers, interested very much in terms of uh, KPI reports because we are also interested in objective evaluation of our work, the same as you are. And all kinds of automated reports, uh, invoicing that can provide breakdowns, very detailed reports in terms of the cost of one service or other on the basis of the rates approved. Just uh, some examples, uh, certainly there may be more. In conclusion, the benefits that, to my opinion, the car manufacturer can receive from such cooperation. You uh free your warehouse from all kinds of operations like labeling sorting uh measuring you can uh, use your efforts for different things you receive visibility and transparency in terms of the uh, lead times you can plan better you can inform your dealers about the uh, delivery days track and trace quite evident that the visibility uh, depends on track and trace of cargo. Uh, uh, consolidated billing invoices, usually uh, you will receive uh, the invoice uh, once or twice a month, which simplifies uh, the life of your accounting department. Monthly KPI reports based on the parameters approved together with the customer. And last but not least is the feedback from the dealers that you would be able to receive. Thus, you will see how much or how poorly the dealers are satisfied with your work. Also, a few words. Yesterday, one of our colleagues, I forgot his name, unfortunately, but there was a very interesting phrase that investment in your own development is always justified. To my opinion, the choice of the correct logistics provider is uh, uh, for any car manufacturer such an investment into your own development. I take part in many tenders and many negotiations and always invite you colleagues to evaluate your logistic partners, not only from the point of view of minimal price but also from the point of view of uh, the whole set of services, because at the end of the day, the price is not the main thing. And then, if uh, you have such a complex, uh, such a comprehensive approach, as uh, our colleague from Mitsubishi company said, you will become Ichiban or number one, if I repeat the Japanese word right. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much for, for that presentation, Michael. Uh, again, I think from the spare parts perspective, um, very interesting points there, not least the, the, the value of communication between, uh, in this case, the service provider and, and the dealer, and how that can, that can be a good feedback loop to, to the customer. Uh, and of course, Major is an interesting company in that regard, because they don't just do spare parts, but I believe you have some dealers yourself, and so there's probably some interesting things we can we could discuss uh, in the Q&A about that. Uh, we're gonna sort of switch to another, uh, let's say part of the supply chain in terms of serving the customer, uh, looking a little bit more at the outbound side uh, with Mark Morgan from, from Unicar. Uh, we can look some specifically at the impacts that, uh, or the importance, let's say, of, of uh, damage prevention and uh, surveying. Thank you, Mark. So um, good morning, as introduced, my name is Mark Morgan and I'm the Director of Business Development for the Unicar Group, which is a member of the Bureau Veritas Group, who's a sponsor here today. Picking up on today's theme, I'd like to give you a view taken from an area of the supply chain that is vitally important and yet sometimes wrongly seen as not a priority, and that is damage management. 
You'll be aware that the development of the global automotive industry over the past 10 years has seen significant changes in both the complexity and the lengthening of the supply chain. Many fa factors impact on a product as the uniquely unprotected compared to all other consumer products that are delivered around the world. This makes it vulnerable to delay and damage, which causes dissatisfaction from a customer expecting his vehicle to arrive in perfect condition and on time. You may also be aware of the conflicting objectives of the key players involved in getting a vehicle from the factory to the customer. In essence, they are trying to get the right car to the right place at the right time, undamaged. But in reality, it's far more complex than that. Each has their own priorities, and these priorities are rarely in the same order of importance for each of the parties. Therefore, it's no wonder that the finished vehicle supply chain has become so unnecessarily complex and difficult. But here I must ask you to ask yourself, has all this complexity made us too busy to appreciate how simple the actual task is? Are we spending a lot of time solving issues that should have been avoided in the first place? And, most importantly, can we really avoid damaging vehicles? After all, damage adds no value to the supply chain and typically ends up being billed to the logistics service provider, eating away at profits that could be going into innovations and vital investments. Let's start by reminding ourselves of the main problems that can occur in moving vehicles anywhere in the world. These fall into two categories, delay and damage. Delays are caused by unpredictable issues like production and weather but they can also be caused by predictable issues like poor planning and a lack of resource such as road, rail, or shipping capacity. Damage is equally caused by forces outside of our control like adverse weather conditions or accidents, but it can also be caused by issues that we can control like bad handling or poor quality facilities like storage compounds, older transporter units that are not suited to today's vehicles, which are wider, taller, and longer than ever before. All these cause a failure to fulfill the brand promise, contributing to an unhappy customer, unnecessary repair costs, and an increase in future insurance costs, which will reduce future profit margins. So our target as an industry should be zero damage. And whilst you may be saying to yourself, this is unrealistic, it needs to be our aim if we're to reduce damages for the benefits of all those involved. So here I've suggested the three key approaches towards zero damage. Plan, manage, and improve. Firstly, through better proactive planning, you can create the right conditions and understanding for all those who will be involved in moving vehicles. Amazingly, many logistics service providers have to work with multiple handling standards in the same compounds. So is it any wonder when they get it wrong? Secondly, Managing in real time can both prevent damage and reduce the impact of damage significantly. Visibility is what everybody wants, and it can and should be the automatic and hopefully free byproduct of a good supply chain process. Inspecting vehicles can be one of the sources of visibility of, as inspections and audits provide instant digital data on what is happening to vehicles and where it is happening. This will put you in control of your vehicles. Thirdly, there will always be room for improvement, and having data gives you the information to identify the causes of damage and how to go about reducing them through training or improved standards. Essentially, this is a continuous circle of improvement that will become easier and easier if you set it up correctly in the first place. So, in practical terms, what should you be doing? The graphic on the slide demonstrates the full range of services available for the whole life of a car that the Bureau Veritas Group can provide. But my focus will be on the left-hand side of the slide, which is new cars. Handover inspections are still the only way to see if and where a vehicle gets damaged within the supply chain. This information is priceless, as it can provide an insight into the quality of your supply chain. Every time a vehicle transfers from one logistics company to another, there should be an inspection done. To see this as purely a cost is opening yourselves up to huge liabilities, and you really do need to reconsider this issue. 
Now, at this point, I'd like to tackle a delicate subject of damages caused before the vehicle has even left the plant, typically at the end of the line. Now, I appreciate that our manufacturing colleagues don't like to be criticized, but is it right they should be allowed to believe that damage of any sort is acceptable? The customer and his representative, the dealer, won't accept this, and the supply chain partners typically have to pay for the cost of rectifying such damage even though they weren't responsible for causing it. Now, you can call this normal if you like, but it's both unfair, causes bad feelings, and can never be eliminated unless people are brave enough to acknowledge and tackle this. Now, I've seen this happen within one of the European manufacturers. It took time and it took courage, but the improvements are plain for all to see. Damages are down, costs are down, supplier loyalty is up, and the customer satisfaction is up. It's a real win-win-win situation. As I say, inspections are the only way to clearly show where and when damages occur. And an independent inspector is there to protect your brand, and those who build the vehicle should be prepared to accept if this is not in the best condition to release from the factory. In the long term, this is the right thing to do. Claims management is another area that is perhaps not fully appreciated and yet is key to reducing costs and damage levels. Even professional insurance companies will acknowledge that it's only by using a specialist who understands finished vehicle logistics that you will stop damages happening by understanding their root cause. I've been told many times before that damages have no consequential loss to the manufacturer or the insurer because the logistics service provider that damaged the vehicle will be forced to pay the cost of repairing the damage. Firstly, I challenge you to prove that you can find the person who damaged the vehicle every time. In fact, less than 30% of damages are traced back to the true culprit, especially when there's no comprehensive and professional system in place to show where and when the damage happened. In truth, it's a game. Yes, I'll say that again, it's a game. A game of who can pass the vehicle from one person to the next without them finding the damage. And like all games, there's an element of risk and of luck. You might get lucky, but you might also lose, and you could also lose very badly. Do reconsider your previously held beliefs or misunderstandings about claims management and reduce your risk considerably. Finally, audits are another way of understanding and controlling the supply chain environment through which your vehicles will pass. Handling standards across suppliers will vary, so don't believe that everybody will interpret your quality standards in the same way. You need to check on a regular basis. Human nature shows us that a supply chain left unmanaged typically reverts back to poor practice very quickly, and this causes avoidable damage. Finally, a brief word on the power of IT for the collection and management of vehicle condition data. As has been mentioned on more than one occasion, collecting data on a vehicle, its condition and location provides you with a number of opportunities to track this asset, manage it better in real time, and understand the causes of damage within the supply chain. Professional organizations like ourselves cannot exist without such operational tools. So if your supplier is not using a modern IT solution, you should be asking them, why not? Some short words about the Bureau Veritas Group to end my presentation today. For those of you who may not have heard of us, we're a three billion euro turnover group working across eight primary sec uh, sections in 140 countries around the world. We're leaders in testing, inspection, and certification. And through our global coverage, we're able to handle vehicles in any part of the world to the same high standard and have the data available through an internet connection almost immediately. If we don't have an office in your location today, we have the ability to set one up very fast. Within the new vehicle damage sector, we have customers from manufacturing, shipping lines, logistics service providers, and insurance companies from around the world. Our debt through experience can become your advantage. So, why use the Bureau Veritas Group? Bureau Veritas, damage management specialist Unicar, has an unrivaled exp expertise in this sector, a global reach, and experience in working with some of the largest brands. We also provide an impartial service 
and provide you with trusted reporting based on data collected and distributed through our advanced in-house built technology. Finally, I'd like to leave you with four key thoughts. As has been mentioned by the previous speaker, the lowest price isn't always the best solution. You will know this, but sometimes it's worth reminding you, as I said earlier, to maybe stop being too busy to see the obvious. Secondly, do consider the outsource, the benefits of outsourcing where expertise is what you really need. Thirdly, we're here to protect your brand promise. I hope you are too. And finally, high damage rates lead to increased future cost. Thanks very much for listening to me today. Thanks very much, Mark. Uh, again, different, different side of the supply chain there, but um, some really important points, and I think some of the things that, that connected to Michael's connect, uh, presentation are certainly the investment in quality and visibility and communication across the supply chain. Um, I also appreciate the, the game Mark referred to about passing the car, although when I was younger, I think it was more about driving them faster than passing them around. But uh, um, again, we will have more we can return to on the Q&A. Before we open that up, I'd like to invite Bill Pollock uh, from CTM. Thank you, Chris. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here today visiting Russia, second time in my life. I'm from Canada of all places. What we have in common there is weather, of course. But it's an unlikely, unlikely place where, where such a, an automotive-based type of solution would come from. I'm from Western Canada. We, we don't have any auto manufacturing there. But I was at one point uh, an auto transportation company, just like many of you here. And I wanted to tackle the problem, the, the big problem everybody always talks about, uh, empty miles, empty miles, empty miles. So I'm here today to talk to you about that. Serving the customer through innovation, that's how I'm going to connect my topic today. We think that we want to serve the customer by giving them new options. New ideas. What are we going to do? Why do we keep accepting the same problem? What are we going to do about it? In this image, I'm uh, showing you that we have a partnership now with Lore Industries. Many of you should be familiar with this company. They're the leader in auto carrier equipment around the world for a significant period of time already. And we've chosen them to be our supporters in this initiative. Over 50 years, uh, Robert Lohr and his team have been working at providing solutions to the industry. And I would like everybody here to recognize that. And Robert Lohr is here in, in the crowd, actually. He spent over 50 years. I think that's an amazing thing. And innovation is so necessary. And it's hugely under-recognized. So I want to congratulate Robert Lohr and his team for making this effort, making this commitment to doing something about this big problem. Here, uh, here's a bit of a complex slide, I guess. There, I think there's 16 innovations that we're going to talk about here, but I'm not going to go through all of them. They're too numerous. But the point is, is they've gone through every part of that equipment and they've improved it to improve safety load coefficients, make it easier to operate. So they have a, a long history in, uh, in innovation. So what is innovation? I want to talk about that a little bit. Novelty is something new. Creation is something new and valuable. Invention is something new, having potential value through utility. Potential value. We've got to go beyond that. Innovation, something that is new and uniquely useful, something that can actually be perhaps commercialized, can actually create a turnover, a profit. So there's many levels to the development of a new idea. The only way of finding what's possible 
is to go into the impossible. I use the analogy of Christopher Columbus in 1492 was told that he was going to fall off the edge of the earth when he wanted to sail across the Atlantic Ocean. But he, he pressed on. And why was that? Because he wanted to know the truth, the real truth. Today, of course, we all realize it. But I don't believe that our mentality has really changed. Human nature hasn't changed. I think we still doubt the unknown. We're curious, but we still doubt it. It's natural. So what is holding back innovation? I'm going to provide a few uh, references here to uh, the US marketplace. Uh, this is a letter that, that uh, talks about the empty mileage factor in North America. 42% is the empty mile factor. It's a significant number. And we accept it for some reason. I don't understand why we accept that. We just say, ah, that's the way it's been done forever. What are we going to do about that? Any other transportation sector does not operate with these types of, these levels of empty miles. Dry van business typically, 12 to 15%. There's a massive gap that we can close here. Where are we now? We talk about human evolution. Over two million years it took for us to progress to where we are today. But there was progress, albeit slow, but there was progress. We must push forward, always testing the status quo. The evolution of auto logistics, I'm going to be very critical of, of this sector. Loading up a truck and delivering a load and coming back empty and doing that over and over and over again, millions of times. There's been innovation in the auto logistics chain in many ways, and you all know about them. We call this turn and burn. Turn and burn. And you're burning for nothing. You're burning tires, you're burning fuel, and you're burning out your drivers. They don't like being non-productive as well. That's been going on for 100 years. You've got to change that. The failings of auto logistics, we'll talk about that. The considerable road waste in all three modes, road, rail, and ocean. We estimate that loss to be about $50 billion in empty miles, empty miles alone. But that's not the entirety of the waste or the loss. It is what's visible, immediately visible, empty miles. The tip of the iceberg, I call it, but the tip of the iceberg is the majority, actually, of the value. But it causes many other additional problems. Equipment idle time. Limitations. Eight billion liters of fuel wasted around the world every year. Massive environmental impact, of course. Financial complications. Can't get credit because it's an underutilized asset and volatility in the marketplace, uncertainty on the bank side right away. They question it. We can change that. We estimate there to be another $25 billion worth of loss due to these additional factors, a total of $75 billion annually around the world in this industry sector. Why can't we drill into that and find a way to extract some of that value? Everybody's looking for more value here. There's a constant push for that. So let's do something about it. Where are we going? We suggest close the loop. This is just a quick animation to demonstrate. We are proposing a pilot project with one of the OEMs. That we're going to ship vehicles one direction and perhaps load up with engines and bring them back to the factory. 1,400 kilometers each way and will be loaded every kilometer of the way. Why not do something like that? <coughs> the convertible trailer. We're bringing the, this product to Europe because your, your legislation actually allows it to happen. We are homologating the equipment for use in Europe. We have prototypes that are coming to the marketplace. These images are just to give you an idea of what, we, what our vision is, what we think can happen give you some new ideas. This image demonstrates an auto box. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. 
For the Russian market, the high mount trailer like this, this is something we think that could be used here. Why not ship a container coming home? A variety of products, dry products, whatever. Military application. This particular load paid more actually than the load of cars that it shipped on the outbound side. There are, are opportunities out there to improve your profitability. More hardware solutions. We talk about the convertible trailer. The next product that uh, we are introducing into the marketplace is the auto box. We are trying to create dry space on an empty auto carrier. Once it's empty, it doesn't have any more autos to, to load. Let's do something different. Let's, let's create dry space and haul some perhaps inbound automotive product or just general freight. <coughs> do something. Dry space, that's the key. 20 auto boxes equals the same volume approximately as a 40 foot container. It's collapsible, making it relocatable more efficiently. Stackable. We want to add trackability to it, of course. We want this to be a standard box all around the world. Two pallet box. Intermodal on auto carrier assets. So every auto carrier today in the world that's running around empty 40% of the time in Russia, I understand it might even be higher. Some markets it's 50%. But all these auto carrier assets are running around empty approaching half the time. Rail car assets, same thing. Row row vessels. Why can't we put the auto box onto those assets when there's no cars to ship, when the flows are unbalanced? Why don't we utilize this capacity to our benefit? This is a, just a quick animation. I think you guys all can probably understand what this, how this is going to operate, but this product is in development today. We have uh, prototypes already, and we will be introducing this into some key pilot projects this fall. simple. Line side ready. Why can't we take these boxes right off the truck and put them, put them in the factories? Why not? Silos. We'll talk about silos. Inbound, outbound uh, logistics departments and all of your organizations typically do not speak with each other because they haven't had the equipment to date that would allow that to happen. The equipment developed to date is, is very advanced, but we have not crossed that bridge between inbound, outbound. Outbound plays all by itself all the time. We need to change that. Let's bring them together. And if there's no inbound product, well, let's just ship general freight. Let's mix in with, let's scale the concept and let's, let's ship general freight. Why not? Turn and earn. We want to refer to this as turn and earn. No more turn and burn. Let's see progress. This is an example of the profitability, and I'm not sure that's even the right term, profitability, $150 at the end of the day of a high-risk operation in the U.S., for example. This is, this is a, an example. If you have a $1,500 gross revenue day, you may make $150 that day for a quarter million dollar investment. Rolling stock, in and out of traffic, busy, busy, busy centers. It doesn't look like a good investment to me. I heard reference yesterday uh, by Elena talking about lack of profit. So, so much risk. We need to change that. With our carrier, if you're going to be coming home empty that day, why not load up with a product? We have examples in the U.S. where we can pick up a $1,000 backhaul. And you immediately think that, oh, you're going to make another 10% on that $1,000, but it's not true. You actually have all your costs paid on your head haul, and much more of the backhaul revenue is available. You can pay your drivers more. They're no longer coming home, not getting paid. Give them incentives. I heard there was a driver shortage. Well, if they got paid better, they might stick around. 
we think that that daily profitability can quintuple. There's lots of value there. That's part of that $75 billion we were talking about earlier. So the convertible trailer, the auto box, pilot projects is our next phase, and then continue on with innovation and development. That's the general plan. And we invite each and every one of you, anybody here, we have partners that are assisting us in this initiative. And I invite additional partners, come talk to me. We want to see how we can set something up, a pilot project perhaps. Maybe you have some other ideas, some special requirements. We're here to listen and do something about it. These next series of slides, we'll just talk to you about the loss in the industry. I want to re-emphasize this fact. Let's not accept this. Why do we accept this? It's about $3 million just during my time here at the podium that the industry has lost. $205 million a day. We could do something with that. That's $75 billion a year again. That's $10 for every human being on Earth. It's a noticeable, it's a, it's, it's a measurable number. It really doesn't need to happen. So this is how we plan on serving the customer, through innovation. I appreciate your time. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Bill. So again, another different take on, on well, I don't know if it's serving a customer, but, but how, what some of the solutions uh, could, could be out there for improving the bottom line, maybe turning some of those, well, if one is lucky, 10% margins or minus 14% margins into, into something that could be uh, much, more, much more profitable. Um, we can move on now. We'll have some time for, for Q&A. Um, if anyone from the audience would like to start, actually, we have a question already right in the back, so that makes it easy. But I am Hitiami uh, from Mitsubishi MM Silus. Uh, today I'm audience. I'm I'm more relaxed today than yesterday. <laughs> so I don't hesitate to ask you questions. So this is a comment and question to Mr. Mark Morgan. So thank you very much for your uh, explanation about uh, quality improvement. So for us, the distributor. The damage control is an uh, uh, important priority agenda, especially this year. Yesterday, I mentioned that, that we should go to the regions. But uh, <clears throat> vice versa, this kind of the damage occurs from the shipment to the dealers, regional dealers. So according to the statistics, we have 138 dealers in Russia, but 25% uh, claims, 25% among the total claims come from the three specific dealers in the regions. So I don't disclose the name of the cities, but uh, <clears throat> this is a fact. So I want to know your comment. Uh, what is a problem or issue to be improved especially in the Russian regions. So oh, I, don't, I, have, I think that you have the experience or the knowledge to compare Russia with other areas. So what is your specific problems to be improved in Russia? I, I think the, um, the comment I'd make back to you is, <clears throat> as you clearly identified, you're getting a large number of claims from a small, small number of dealers. And that requires you to identify what's going on. And therefore, as I explained in my presentation, firstly, you need to start to gather the information which tells you clearly where the damage is happening. Um, but also, by having a much clearer um, focus on the problem of damages, I think you will find that some of these dealers may be using this as an opportunity to make some money. Let's be honest. I think a number of dealers do see this as a profit and loss opportunity within supply chain, and our experience across the rest of Europe, North America, South America is exactly the same as you have here. A large number of claims coming from a small number of dealers. 
and by focusing, by having audits where you maybe go into the dealer and you start to say to them, okay, let's look at this problem, let's try and sort it out. Um, I think you will start to find those claims will start to reduce immediately. Okay, but as I said, clearly you need to have a full visibility of what's happening throughout the supply chain, which can be achieved either by doing inspections. Now I know a lot of people, as I said in the presentation, feel that inspections are a very expensive way of doing this. The alternative is to do some audits, where you go and look at specific issues, but also it's just collecting the data, which will give you the trends of what's happening, whether those damages are happening in, it, happening in one particular part of the supply chain or the particular supplier in the supply chain. You'll only get to know that if you start to collect this data on a regular and consistent basis. So those are the comments I'd make back. I hope that's answered the question for you, and maybe we can have a further dialogue later. Uh, the, yeah. Yes, I wanted to uh, add a few words in terms of a logistics service provider. In terms of Russian law, it's easy to check where the damage occurred. Uh, there's a transportation document uh, uh, bill where uh, there's a, no a special note to be uh, recorded, so it's easy for you to understand. Was it an error by the logistics provider? Uh, does your scheme work or you change something, you check your package or the cargo uh, came with no damage and there's no, no, no record, so it's the dealer's uh, fault uh, who accepted the cargo uh, with no damage. So it, it's up to you. you you got to work with your dealers. And I agree with colleague. you, you, you got to look into the situation, collect information, try and understand where the damage occurs, and then you'll see, you'll know what to do next. Thank you for those comments, Mikhail. Any other questions from the floor? Um, again, those of you may have been looking on the live site, but uh, we've had a few more comments from, from Eugenie from General Motors, and I just wanted to, because one of them perhaps can be uh, kind of a question to, to Mikhail. Um, Eugenie says that in terms of delivery time for dealers, uh, he doesn't think we should make crazy things, crazy promises such as next day delivery for regions with long distances and poor road infrastructure. Uh, better to agree with uh, a dealer a reasonable lead time and keep focus on it with 97% uh, performance rate. So usually dealers are fine to have a three or five day delivery uh, when it is known and stable. Uh, and I just thought, Mikhail, I thought it would be interesting just to have some of your comments on that perhaps. Um, in some ways, it seems to suggest that, depending on where a customer is, that they, they theoretically might, might get a poorer service, or maybe not poorer service, not the right word, but a different service. Um, is, is, that, is that how you, you know, would agree the supply chain should be managed? Better to have stable slower rather than um, more expensive and unpredictable, um, you know, faster? Thank you for your question. Let me get back to the idea I try to convey to you in my presentation. Um, more often than not, the manufacturer wants, some wants the impossible from the logistics provider. And it's uh, pleasant, it's a pleasure when uh, considering Russian realities, it's impossible to uh, deliver without uh, uh, loss of quality to some remote regions of uh, Russia due to problems with infrastructure, uh, poor roads and things like that. That is why uh, when uh, we uh, are involved in the development logistics solutions, uh, we believe it's got to be an interaction between the customer, the uh, auto manufacturer, and the logistics service provider. It's got to be a dialogue. We have the experience. We have uh, the understanding, the means, uh, the equipment, the skills. We're professionals. This is our business and we are always there to uh, advise you to pr uh, give you recommendations to come up with uh, the best solutions but uh, you got to understand that if this is talking about uh, remote regions nothing can get there overnight so you it's important for you to understand uh, the experience of your logistics service provider 
uh, whether your provider is uh, objective and then KPIs, because uh, uh, you can promise anything, but then put it down uh, the lead time. But then very quickly, you will see that the lead time is promised cannot be kept. And uh, two, three weeks later, you will see that uh, you can never get what was promised to you. So first, it's about initial dialogue planning uh, and then uh, quality control. Uh, and then everything will be clear for everyone. Thank you. Any questions from the floor at this time? The young gentleman in the corner with the beautiful flowing hair. Thank you, Chris. Uh, this is a question for Michal from a Major. Uh, major is, um, as well as being a, a logistics company, uh, is also a major dealership, one of the biggest dealerships in Russia. Uh, I was wondering how that uh, affects your, um, what service, or, or how you develop your services, in this instance for service parts. With your dealership experience, are you able, what have you learned from being a dealer that maybe other logistic service providers can't learn because they don't experience the dealer side? And have you shared any of these experiences uh, back to the car makers as well? Because you're in a unique position of being a logistics comp company and, uh, and a dealership. Thank you for your question. Certainly, I've mentioned this in my presentation as well, that we are a unique company on the Russian market. We are a supplier, but on the other hand, we may uh, be perceived as a customer in this same uh, segment of services. So very often, in order to understand what dealers want, we do not need to really meet our partners, our colleagues. Suffice it to have some internal meetings at the same territory and have feedback from uh, our divisions, our dealers' divisions, in order to understand what the dealers want. And this information is extremely valuable to us. We exchange this information inside the company. We introduce it into our technologies, into our solutions, since we as a company are oriented to, uh, to a very high level of uh, services. Uh, and I think the results we uh, uh, demonstrate in the market as of recently in the sphere of uh, logistics and in the sphere of dealerships shows that the level of uh, interactions between our divisions uh, allows us to exchange information and achieve these high re results. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, any other questions from the audience right now? Right in the front. Thank you. Christopher Kenmore from VNet. Um, I would like to go back to what Mark and hikiyami san were talking about earlier on with, um, and you say zero damage is unrealistic. Is it really unrealistic? I mean, can we not uh, use technology, use um, handheld devices to inspect the cars? And you say inspection is expensive, but is surely damage is more expensive. I think my, my comment was that zero damages should be our objective and I was suggesting that maybe other people would think I was being unrealistic. No, we believe zero damages is possible. Um, and I say, it's, it's, but it's a combination. It's a combination of the use of technology to collect the data, to actually identify, uh, understand what's happening, but also it's a mindset. It's changing the mindset that says that damage is just inevitable, acceptable, and in certain cases, some people will tell you, ah, our damage rate is less than 1%. Sorry, that's not true. Damage rate is less than 1% if measured in certain ways. And actually what's happening is a lot of people are saying damage is unavoidable or it's there or actually we're happy to let it happen because it keeps certain parties happy. And again, I'm here to be honest about this situation and to try and gain, hopefully raise the, the, uh, the conversation to say actually it's unacceptable, it doesn't add any value to the supply chain at all and actually typically costs people in the supply chain money which should be going towards investment. And as we've all talked about, investment in the future, especially at a time when there's low profitability in certain marketplaces, is vital. So that's why I'm saying it is realistic to say zero damages could be achieved, but it's a combination of good working practice, technology, 
and a change of the mindset. So I think that was my point, Chris. Okay? Okay. Thanks for that. A question here in the third row. From GM. My question is to Bill. Great thanks for your presentation, a very interesting presentation. I am responsible for spare parts in my company, and we also use in our company the uh, returnable packaging. Major can confirm this because they are our providers for Moscow and St. Pete. My question is as follows. Do you have any statistics in terms of Europe or U.S.? How many companies in persons use this uh, uh, returnable packaging or uh, loading the back holes when they return the trucks? Thank you for your question. Um, to clarify, we are a new company. We do not have the stats that you are looking for. We are proposing to do inbound with outbound, and we will be gathering those statistics through our pilot projects. So we initially started this project in the US and we ran into a legislation problem there, and uh, so we, our, our project got delayed, we'll say, and we're getting the legislation amended as we speak. We have a, the largest auto carrier group, uh, Jack Cooper in North America, who is committed now to this project, and we are going to be combining outbound with inbound and general freight. So we'll be able to supply those statistics to the marketplace as soon as they're available. But as of today, I do not have those statistics for you. So, but thank you for the question. Okay. Any other comments, questions from the floor? Uh, Mark, um, you, you, you sort of suggest that, or am I mistaken, that, that, the, that there should be inspections that nearly every handover? Is that, is that what you're saying? And if so, is that, is that something that any manufacturers are currently doing, uh, to your knowledge? Uh, yes. Um, I, we have a global contract with the Volkswagen Group in particular where we do inspect at every stage um, of the, the logistics supply chain. Um, as I say, I've, I've heard, and I've heard indeed in the last couple of days, a number of people saying, ah, this is a very expensive way of doing it. But again, not seeing the real, you know, the real story here, which is the real story is understanding better what is truly happening in the supply chain. Um, now again, if people believe that actually inspecting every time a car is handed between one supplier to the other is an expensive way of doing it, then think about auditing. But put something in place. Understand what is truly happening. Don't be blind. Don't accept that this, this just happens and therefore you know, it can't be helped and it's just a cost of doing business. Um, as I say, we would obviously advocate using inspections at every time, at every stage. Talk to people who do that already. See the benefits they get. Understand the visibility they start to understand about what's happening in their supply chain. They get to actually work out who are good suppliers, who are bad suppliers, what can be done to avoid damage. All those things, all this valuable information comes from inspecting vehicles. But also, you know, you put people on the... Uh, on notice that you're not going to accept um, damages happening by poor practice. And again, standards, that's another thing I've heard over the last couple of days. You know, use of standards, consistency of standards, harmonization of standards. This is work we did in Europe a number of years ago. And indeed, in the US, everybody now uses one common quality standard uh, called AIAG. Now, I know that's you know, not necessarily an easy thing to implement, but I would say it certainly improves dramatically the quality when each inspection or each agent is, is working to the same standard. So again, that's a very key part of that, and that's something that should be looked at, um, you know, certainly in other regions of the world. Chris. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Michael, you, you talked about, obviously, the sort of same multimodal approach that the major has, obviously, um, different, different lead times for air, uh, road, and I was just wondering what kind of percentage of the spare parts that you're moving do tend to move by air in Russia? Is it a high percentage? Is it something that you work together with your customer to, to try to reduce? Because it obviously must be uh, the most expensive as well. Um, so if we can maybe get some perspective on the air freight side. Thank you for your question. Air freight in Ru the Russian Federation is a separate story because all the regional air freights, especially 
since we have a lot of limitations and the regional airports are not much different from the Moscow, uh, are very much different from Moscow airport, even Pulkova airport in St. Petersburg have very big limitations. So if we speak about air freight, then first and foremost, we look here on to uh, the wishes of our customers in terms of urgency, because very often manufacturers of uh, uh, the parts are ready to pay for express deliveries. In this case, uh, air deliveries are considered as priority ones. And second, there are some limitations in terms of the possibilities of the airports and uh, limitations of uh, hazardous cargo by airlines. For example, lubricants, oils, accumulators, batteries cannot go by air. They will go um, by surface modes of transport. Taking into account all these factors, we make decisions which mode of transport to choose. Air uh, transportation is uh, great, quick, and uh, safe, but this is very expensive. If uh, we speak about percentage, and sh I can say that this is uh, number one of transportation. The majority of spare parts go by rail or by road, taking urgency into account, taking remoteness uh, into account, the volumes and my experience, especially in the automotive business, uh, usually air transportation amounts to 5 to 10 percent, not more. Thank you for that. Do we have any uh, final questions or comments anyone wants to make? If not, I think that that's, that's a good po point to end it. We can, we can break for coffee. Um, I'd like to thank our panel first for their presentations and Q&A. Uh, we'll break for coffee. We'll be back in here talking about connecting Russia to the rest of the world. Just a quick reminder, in front of you there are evaluation forms um, which you can fill out uh, either in English or Russian. Uh, please do take, take some time to, to fill them in. Give us your feedback. We really do value it. We, we take it very seriously. And um, I think there's a, a draw at the end of the conference, uh, so if you hand them in, you, you stand to win something. So please do that, and uh, we'll see you in 45 minutes.